Hey, got the internet grandpa here. And uh, we got a bunch of gals at the house for uh, Auntie Heather getting married. They're all getting together to do some hen do. So uh, I got out of the house. I'm going to sit in the car here by the park and we're going to read from the Secret Garden, Chapter 6. And it's titled, There Was Someone Crying, There Was. The next day, the rain poured down in torrents again, and when Mary looked out her window, the moor was almost hidden by gray mist and cloud. There could be no going out today. What do you do in your cottage when it rains like this? asked Martha. Try to keep them from under each other's feet, mostly, Martha answered. Hey, there does seem a lot of us then. Mother's a good-tempered woman, but she gets fair-mothered. The biggest one goes out in the cow shed and plays there. Dickon, he don't mind the wet. He goes out just the same as if the sun was shining. He says he sees things on rainy days as doesn't show when it's fair weather. He once found a little fox cub half drowned in its hole and he brought it home in the bosom of his shirt to keep it warm. Its mother had been killed nearby and the hole was swum out and the rest of the litter was dead. He's got it at home now. He found a half drowned young crow another time and he brought it home too and tamed it. It's named Soot because it's so black and it hops and flies with him everywhere. Soot. The time had come when Mary had forgotten to resent Martha's familiar talk. She'd even begun to find it interesting and to be sorry when she stopped or went away. The stories she had been told by Aya when she lived in India had been quite unlike those Martha had to tell about the Moreland Cottage, which held 14 people who lived in four little rooms and never had quite enough to eat. The children seemed to tumble about and amuse themselves like a litter of rough, good-natured collie puppies. Mary was most attracted by the mother and Dickon. When Martha told stories of what mother said or did, they always sounded comfortable. If I had a raven or a fox cub, I could play with it, said Mar Mary, but I have nothing. Martha looked perplexed. Can thou knit? she asked. No, answered Mary. Can thou sew? No, can thou read? Yes, then thou dost, then why doesn't thou read something or learn a bit of spelling? Thou'st old enough to be learning thy book a good bit now. I haven't any books, said Mary. Those I had were left in India. That's a pity, said Martha. If Mrs. Medlock let thee go to the library, there's, a th there's thousands of books there. But Mary did not ask where the library was because she was suddenly inspired by a new idea. She made up her mind to go and find it herself. She was not troubled about Mrs. Medlock. Mrs. Medlock seemed always to be in her comfortable housekeeper's sitting room downstairs. In this queer place, one scarcely ever saw anyone at all. In fact, there was no one to see but the servants. And when their master was away, they lived a luxurious life below stairs, where there was a huge kitchen hung about with shining brass and pewter and a large servant's hall where there were four or five abundant meals eaten every day, and where a great deal of lively romping went on when Mrs. Medlock was out of the way. Mary's meals were served regularly, and Martha waited on her, but no one troubled themselves about her in the least. Mrs. Medlock came and looked at her every day or two, but no one inquired what she did or told her what to do. She sp supposed that perhaps this was the English way of treating children. In India, she had always been attended by her ayah who had followed her about and waited on her hand and foot. She had often been tired of her company. Now she was followed about by nobody and was learning to dress herself because Martha looked as though she thought she was silly and stupid when she wanted to have things handed to her to put on. Hasn't thou got good sense, she said once when Mary had stood waiting for her to put on her gloves for her. Our Susan Ann is twice as sharp as thee and she's only four years old. Sometimes thou looks fair soft in the head. Mary had worn her contrary scowl for an hour after that, but it made her think 
several entirely new things. So Mary would just stand there waiting for Martha to put on her gloves. And Martha told her, you're not very bright, are you? <laughs> she stood at the window for about 10 minutes this morning after Martha had swept up the hearth for the last time and gone downstairs. She was thinking over the new idea which had come to her when she heard of the library, when she'd heard of the library. She did not care very much about the library itself, but she had read very few books. But to hear of it brought back to her mind the hundred rooms and closed doors. She wondered if they were all really locked and what she would find if she could get into any of them. Were there a hundred, really? Why shouldn't she go and see how many doors she could count? It would be something to do on this morning when she could not go out. She had never been taught to ask permission to do things. She knew nothing at all about authority, so she would not have thought it necessary to ask Mrs. Medlock if she might walk about the house, even if she had seen her. She opened the door of the room and went into the corridor. Then she began her wanderings. It was a long corridor and it branched into other corridors and it led her up short flights of steps, which mounted to others again. There were doors and doors, and there were pictures on walls. Sometimes there were pictures of dark, curious landscapes, but oftenest there were portraits of men and women in queer grand costumes made of satin and velvet. She found herself in one long gallery whose walls were covered with these portraits. She never thought there could be so many in any house. She walked slowly down this place and stared at the faces, which also seemed to stare at her. She felt as if they were wondering what a little girl from India was doing in their house. Some were pictures of children, like girls in thick satin frocks, which reached their feet and stood out about them, and boys with puffed sleeves and lace collars and long hair or with big ruffs around their necks. She always stopped to look at the children and wondered what their names were and where they had gone and why they wore such odd clothes. There was a stiff, plain little girl rather like herself. She wore a green brocade dress and held a green parrot on her finger. Her eyes had a sharp, curious look. Where do you live now? said Mary aloud to her. I wish you were here. Surely no other little girl ever spent such a queer morning it seemed as if there were no one in the, in all the huge rambling house but her own small self, wandering about upstairs and down through narrow passages and wide ones, where it seemed to her that no one but herself had ever walked. Since so many rooms had been built, people must have lived in them, but it all seemed so empty that she could not quite believe it true. It was not until she climbed to the second floor that she shot a thought of turning the handle of a door. All the doors were shut, as Mrs. Medlock had said they were, but at last she put her hand on the handle of one of them and turned it. She was almost frightened for a moment when she felt that it turned without difficulty and that when she pushed upon the door itself, it slowly and heavily opened. It was a massive door and opened into a big bedroom. There were embroidered hangings on the wall and inlaid furniture such as she had seen in India stood about the room. A broad window with leaded panes looked out upon the moor and over the mantel was another portrait of the stiff, plain little girl who seemed to stare at her most cu more curiously than ever. Perhaps she slept here once, said Mary. She stares at me so that she makes me feel queer. After she opened more doors and more, she saw so many rooms that she became quite tired and began to think there must be a hundred, though she had not counted them. In all of them, there were old pictures or old tapestries with strange scenes worked on them. There were curious pieces of furniture and curious ornaments in nearly all of them. In one room, which looked like a lady's sitting room, the hangings were all embroidered velvet. And in a cabinet, there was about a hundred little elephants made of ivory. They were of different sizes. And some had their mahouts or palaquins on their backs. Some were much bigger than others. 
and some were so tiny that they seemed only babies. Mary had only seen carved ivory in India, and she knew all about elephants. She opened the door of the cabinet and stood at the footstool and played with these for quite a long time. Then she got tired. She set the elephants in order and shut the door of the cabinet. In all of her wanderings through the long corridors and empty rooms, she had seen nothing alive. But in this room, she saw something. Just after she closed the cabinet door, she heard a tiny rustling sound. It made her jump, and she looked around at the sofa by the fireplace, from which it seemed to come. In the corner of the sofa there was a cushion, and the velvet which covered it, there was a hole, and out of the hole peeped a tiny head and a pair of frightened eyes in the head. Mary crept softly across the room to look. The bright eyes belonged to a little gray mouse, and the mouse had eaten a hole in the cushion and made a comfortable nest there. Six baby mice were cuddled up asleep near, near her, and there was no one else alive in a hundred rooms. There were several mice who did not look lonely at all. If there was no one else alive in the hundred rooms, there were seven mice who did not look lonely at all. If they wouldn't be so frightened, I would take them back with me, said Mary. She had wandered about long enough to feel too tired to wander any farther, and she turned back. Two or three times, she lost her way by turning down the wrong corridor and was obliged to ramble up and down until she found the right one. But at last, she reached her own floor again, though she was some distance from her own room and did not know exactly where she was. I believe I have taken a wrong turn again, she said, standing still in what seemed the end of a short passage with the tapestry on the wall. I don't know which way to go. How still everything is. It was while she was standing here, and just after she said this, that the stillness was broken by a sound. It was another cry, but not quite like the one she had heard last night. It was only a short one, a fretful child whine muffled by passing through walls. It's nearer than it was, said Mary, her heart beating rather fast, and it is crying. She put her hand accidentally upon the tapestry near her, and then sprang back, feeling quite startled. The tapestry was the covering of a door which fell open and showed her that there was another part of the corridor behind it. And Mrs. Medlock was coming up, up it with her bunch of keys in her hand with a very cross look on her face. What are you doing here, she said, and she looked at Mary and she took Mary by the arm and pulled her away. What did I tell you? I turned around the wrong co corner, explained Mary. I didn't know which way to go and I heard someone crying. She quite hated Mrs. Medlock at the morning, at the moment, but she hated her more the next. You didn't hear anything of the sort, said the housekeeper. You come along back to your own nursery or I'll box your ears. And she took her by the arm and half pushed, half pulled her up one passage and down another until she pushed her in at the door of her own room. Now, she said, you stay where you're told to stay or you'll find yourself locked up. The master had better get you a governess, same as he said he would. You're one that needs someone to look sharp after you. I've got enough to do. She went out of the room and slammed the door behind her, and Mary went and sat on the hearth rug, pale with rage. She did not cry, but she ground her teeth. There was someone crying. There was, there was, she said to herself. She'd heard it twice now, and sometime she would find out. She had found out a great deal this morning. She felt as if she had been on a long jury. And at any rate, she had had something to amuse her all the time. And she had played with the ivory, ivory elephants and had seen the gray mouse and its babies in their nest in the velvet cushion. Well, thanks for listening. Make sure you click like and subscribe. Love you. Bye-bye.